Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our afternoon session of uh, fearless data sharing across borders. Uh, I'm your host this afternoon. I'm Sara Ramazani from SURF. I'm uh, the lead team lead of the data preservation services team. Uh, we uh, run, among others, the data archive service of SURF, uh, of SURF which um, preserves dozens of uh, petabytes of research data from various uh, Dutch and international research communities. I'm here. Um, to discuss the very interesting topic of uh, sharing data without losing control over it. So this is the basic, the basic concept that we're going to talk about today. And I'm, I have a, uh, we're going to have one keynote uh, speech and uh, a panel with distinguished guests. So I'm going to, without further ado, uh, start with um, our keynote speaker, Michiel de Jong. Uh, Michiel is an open source entrepreneur at Ponder Source. He has worked on personal data stores before, such as Solid, Unhosted, and Nextcloud. Uh, he's also worked on advocacy projects, such as Terms of Service Didn't Read. And at uh, Firefox, he's worked uh, on the Firefox OS phone for Mo Mozilla and Interledger Protocol for Ripple. His talk is titled Federated Bookkeeping, Connected but Sover Sovereign. Please, Mathiel. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, so um, today I'll talk about federated bookkeeping, uh, which is what uh, uh, we at Ponosource try to build. So bookkeeping systems are uh, systems that hold data that is important to a user, to a person, or to a company. And that's why people often don't connect them together, because it's scary. And so it's the perfect thing to want to federate. Uh, and um, today, at uh, in, or in the sort of research week, we also think a lot about how we can federate our research systems, uh, where obviously the, uh, the data sets that we use for research are also at least non-public, so they need to be kept private, but they need to be shared so that you can um, confirm each other's research. Um, so for bookkeeping systems are used to coordinate trade, and um, the, uh, the important way to coordinate trade, uh, the, the easy way to do it is with money, um, but a better way to do it is actually sharing the data so that you can see uh, what your suppliers are doing, you can see what your customers are doing, and that gives a better integration of trade and a more um, liquid trade. So that's why we work on um, federated bookkeeping. Um, and a bookkeeping system is a little bit like a garden. You have things in there that you love, and uh, there's also a fence around it. Um, and uh, of course, you interact with the world outside your garden. Sometimes there's read access, so uh, people see data, data from your computer system. Sometimes there's write access, so people can actually change the content of your, um, your computer system. That's obviously more scary. Uh, because they might change it in a way that, uh, uh, that affects you. Um, and often, I think, when computer systems are federated, uh, you can, you're allowed to read something, but you're not really supposed to pass it on. Um, and uh, if you're allowed to write something, then at first it means that you, when you read something from one computer system to another, you're already copying it. And then writing just means that the, the truth, the true copy of the data uh, is merged back to the original. So um, one thing we'll talk about later is how you can transform data before sharing it or how you can uh, federate computation so uh, you can bring the algorithm to the data. Uh, but what I'll talk about is how you can federate data systems and what architectures exist for that. So there are a number of architectures um, that we don't uh, often think about um, in this list, but um, that I think are important when you want to federate data systems. And they're all, they all have some important things to bring to uh, your system. And, and I think the power is in combining elements from all these architectures. So uh, the ones I want to discuss are uh, linked data, uh, very much linked to the World Wide Web, and uh, semantic web, and uh, global data, which is uh, also known as content addressable data, 
uh, which I'll talk about later. Collaborative data, it's where you, there's real-time collaboration uh, on the same copy of something using messages. And federated data, which is uh, maybe a bit of a sum of the other three. Um, so starting with linked data. Uh, linked data is all about hyperlinks. So uh, this is a picture of the, um, the linked open data cloud. There are um, data documents on the web that link to other data documents. Um, so in the same way that, um, that hypertext documents on the, the document web point to each other. Um, so the World Wide Web, um, by, uh, uh, invented by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, is mostly uh, very well known for uh, linked hypertext documents um, and, uh, and the easy access we have to them through URLs. Um, it's much more about uh, reading than about writing, although uh, the research that uh, Sir Tim continued doing was a lot about um, how you could use the web for data, but also how you could write that data. And uh, an important protocol there uh, that you may know is WebDAV, where you can give somebody not only read access, not only the HTTP get verb, but also write access, so maybe a, a post or a put or a patch. Um, and there are other protocols uh, for that. Um, uh, so the idea that the, the web is one global writable resource is, I still think, not, still not really um, uh, 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 true. We, we, we want it to be that way, but people, hard, people uh, rarely open up their web server for writing. Um, so it's usually there will be one server, for instance, the Wikipedia website is writable in itself, um, um, but this is not true for the web in, in general. So personal data stores are websites that um, they may contain do documents, but they'll also uh, contain a lot of data documents where uh, the owner of the data or the subject of the data is hosting this. So it's sort of your personal web server, um, and uh, it's a bit like a closet maybe. You can put your, um, your different types of data in there, and then different applications uh, could get access to your own personal data store um, through, for instance, the Web Access Control pro uh, Protocol, where you, have, you define who is allowed write access to your data, who is allowed read access to your data, and um, with web access control, we can build um, a, a system, the, the actual uh, linked, semantic, um, read-writable web, as uh, Sir Tim uh, uh, envisioned it. And, uh, and the, the project working on that now is the SOLID project, um, which I've also uh, been involved in. So the next type of architecture I want to briefly mention is uh, global data. So by global, I mean that a piece of data doesn't belong to a specific location. So it's not on a specific server. Um, so for instance, maybe, well, a book exists in your library, but through your library you have access to uh, books that by their title are, um, uh, the book object is a copy of the book text, which is, a glo which is globally unique. So. Um, an example of that, for instance, is uh, uh, global blockchains uh, like Bitcoin, where there's only one um, ledger where through the mining algorithms, uh, people can, u we uniquely agree what this and that transaction is on this global ledger. And so there's not one server in charge, but there's, uh, there's a global consensus of what this data is. And this data is also often, um, content addressable, so you have, a, for instance, a hash of the data that, um, by which you can search it. Instead of searching for a piece of data by the URL of the server that is authoritative about it, you search for a piece of data um, by, a, by a hash of it. So you identify, um, for instance, when you share music via BitTorrent, uh, you would identify the torrent and then it doesn't matter which peer this data comes from, uh, you just all agree that this is the same unique piece of global data. Uh, what you, you might call an evolution of BitTorrent is uh, interplanetary file system, which is a very uh, science fiction-like name for a very cool project. 
um, where the idea is, well, what if we all have just one file system and we run it collaboratively and we make it robust so that you could even run it across planets that have delays of multiple minutes between them. Um, and one thing that happens uh, when blockchains get slow, uh, you get, for instance, on top of bitcoins, there's Bitcoin Lightning. It's called a second layer network. They, are, they become sort of a hybrid between, block, um, between uh, global and um, uh, collaborative data because they use messages on top of the global letter. So two people maybe send across a lot of messages that are signed, and at the end of the day, you can, or you can always like, take somebody to court because they signed their messages, so you take them to ledger, um, and uh, the real truth is given by the global ledger, but um, there is a, a hybrid layer on top of it which just consists of peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging. And that's also the next, uh, uh, the next type of data I want to briefly touch upon. So collaborative data, um, you use messages to reach consensus. Um, you uh, may know Etherpad as, uh, or Google Docs as online services where you can work together to edit the same document that you see each other's cursor. Um, so what this often uh, uses is, uh, um, well, they used to use operational transforms and now they use uh, conflict-free uh, replicatable data types. It's basically a way of saying, how can we send messages to each other and be sure that if we send enough messages and repeat them, uh, that we'll reach consensus, uh, even if there was delay in delivering some of those messages and, and the order got mess, messed up. So um, they're, they're very interesting mathematically, which makes it fun to work on. And uh, it's very good user experience if you can edit a piece of data in real time. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, um, a screenshot of Etherpad where the one person is typing in pink and one person is typing in blue. And uh, over the network, they're adding the same document. And if you ask, well, where does this document live? Then you can't really answer that. It's not hosted in one of the two servers like it would be with linked data or with the web. It's also not global because it's really shared only by two people and it's not anywhere else and, and it's also evolving. Um, so it's sort of, that's, I get, that's why Etherpad is a, is a good name. It's sort of in the ether between the messages that get sent. And one interesting thing here is that um, um, you can't really deal with write access because uh, if you, as soon as you copy uh, other people in the collaboration, they could either accept or reject your edits and there's no, ma there's no main copy that would be authoritative over, over um, uh, applying this access, this right access. So uh, that's why it's an interesting research field how um, the, the concept of right access changes when you use uh, collaborative data architecture. So open cloud mesh, which um, is related to CS3, uh, which you'll hear more about in the next session, maybe with the, uh, the EOSC session, um, is a, I would describe Open Cloud Mesh as a way to invite somebody to edit uh, or to mount some document into their own um, personal cloud server or their own enterprise file sharing server. Uh, so OCM would, Open Cloud Mesh would take care of the invite and the accepting the invite and um, then it hands off to, for instance, WebDAV to uh, do the actual data transfer. Um, uh, so this is a, yeah, the invite that we would send through OCM. And um, one thing I worked on myself in this uh, uh, context is uh, SNAP, um, uh, synchronized network um, uh, accounting protocol, we called it. And uh, it's a way to send messages to each other. It's basically a CRDT for bookkeeping. Um, and... Uh, that's uh, another way to collaboratively uh, administer uh, a ledger between two parties. So sort of ether, ether pad for, uh, for bookkeeping ledgers. Um, and um, that brings me to federated data, uh, which uh, I guess is in some way it's a, it's a sum of those. Uh, it's, but it's also, yeah, it's, it's a way of thinking about data like everybody has their own copy, like 
the garden, it was your copy, your sovereign over your copy, but you are connected through this federation with other copies of maybe the same data, maybe a, a, something that's really a copy, a, a, a lesser copy of it, um, uh, or maybe it's collaborative floating around this uh, federation. And um, one good example of federated data is, I think, uh, Git, the versioning system. Um, so you can collaborate very well. And um, for instance, when you're a programmer like myself, you you uh, you do that for your source code. And uh, but one thing that it, it doesn't give you is the decision about when to merge and when to pull. That's all human decisions by design. But Git is just a, a tool to execute those decisions. Say yes, I want to merge this branch into this branch and rebase it on that. Um, Network ledger technology, technology is a sort of a name I gave to uh, when you use a credit network instead of a blockchain ledger. Uh, so you own, in, instead of this second ledger manager, which is messaging on top of a blockchain, you would use only the messaging. So you use a credit network to exchange messages. And uh, through multi-hop, you could still reach the whole network, sort of like interledger um, and uh, yeah, and Bitcoin Lightning, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, this is also what banks do when they collaborate. They just send messages to each other. Uh, currently, they're mostly swift messages they send. And, but in the end, each bank has their own ledger. They're, they're, they're never going to um, collaborate on a ledger because they want to. The ledger is their big thing. That's what they do. But they send messages to each other. And these messages get validated and, and imported. And uh, that way, they, you sort of get the idea, like, it doesn't matter if I transfer from ING to Rabo or from ING to ING. It's the same feeling. Like, it feels like one big network. Um, XBRL is a, especially in uh, uh, federated bookkeeping, is an uh, accounting ontology. So that's uh, an example of when you need to, when you exchange data, when you send the, your year report to the tax office, what does it mean? What do you mean when you say that department's uh, global uh, gains for this year? There's all the, these XML tags um, for that, which is not a very big topic. Like once you know how to share data, how do you interpret that you speak the same uh, language? But I think the main thing that is uh, for federated data, so federated bookkeeping, um, in the case of what we work on at uh, Pondersource, uh, but federated data, um, scientific data, is uh, what uh, EOSC um, and um, what we're talking about today. You want your system to be connected, but you also want it to stay sovereign. So um, that's what you need for fearless data sharing across borders, as is the title of this uh, session. And I think um, giving read access is a lot easier, than, uh, easier to define than giving write access. Um, and um, there's, uh, yeah, there's uh, data sovereignty. Data share is the uh, is is the uh, uh, the thing we want to talk about here. So um, what I try to do in this talk is talk about the architectures of these computer systems, and uh, what I hope we can talk about the panel is all the um, uh, the implications of how you actually organize this if this data is about real humans and it's real scientists. Um, doing that in practice. practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michiel, for this very interesting talk. Um, I have one question, actually, from our chat. Uh, so Claudia is asking, who owns the data on the Etherpad? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think the answer doesn't exist. I think <laughs> as, well, when you collaborate on an Etherpad, you should have sort of at the human layer, you should have a sense of, uh, either I'm helping you with your text, or we're doing this together. Yeah. And um, I think in science, uh, one thing you'll recognize is once that the PhD student has done a lot of work and read the paper, then in which orders do the names appear on the author list of the of the the paper that gets published? Right. Um, so yeah, it's only it gives you a way to collaborate, but it doesn't even ask the question like who's the owner. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, quite interesting. Um, so I have, an, I have another one. So uh, Sergey says that, but even read access is difficult if it concerns personal data, right? Um, Which yeah. actually I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So one of the things we uh, talked about earlier is that um, if you, 
currently, say you have one uh, system where your data is, and you need that data to go to another system as a user. So for instance, I want to uh, use some service, and I can log in with my university identity. Right. I want to tell my university, yes, it's OK if you share my identity data with that server. So something like Surf Connects. Yeah, like yeah. Surf Connect. Yeah. That was actually what we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the case of Surf Connect, it's like, yeah, the, the consent of sharing that data, that's a, um, uh, a difficult topic. And so one thing you could do with a personal data store is that you say, first, you, you pull uh, identity data from this uh, verifier. So you get a signed message saying, yes, you really work at this university. Right. And then you yourself give that to the service where you want to log in. So It's twofold. Yeah, so then uh, the identity provider doesn't even get asked if they are allowed to share the data yeah. because they just give it to the data subject. Yeah. And the data subject then acts as the data controller in passing that on. Yeah. So one architecture for doing that is with a personal data store. So they put the data in your solid pod. But that requires you to have a data um, solid. A solid pod. Yeah. And another way is uh, to have a data conduit. Um, so in, in Dutch, they call it... Um, uh, a difference between a data klaus and a data slaus, so uh -huh. a data store or a data conduit, yeah. where you just temporarily pass the data through some, uh, maybe something like uh, Irma, and then you give it to the, uh, the service that needs it. But uh, yeah, if the data pass, if the data subject is temporarily the data controller, that makes that a lot easier. Right. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question from our chat, and then we're going to go on to introduce the panel. How do you, uh, Nargis is asking, how do you see open data and open source technologies evolve in the next 20 years, and what will be the role of communities? A, a bit of a tangent, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I think um, there's, well, I'm very interested in, in business models for open source, so that the company I'm starting now is, um, I'm, I'm thinking of whether to use the model from uh, Mozilla, so they're a, an open source company owned by a foundation, or from a radically open security, they are a, a fundraising uh, um, project institute, mm -hmm. so they make money and give that money to an LNET. Um, and I think that's a good way to do open source. There's a, a recently Open Collective launched a new thing to uh, help companies give money to open source. So. I think that the business model of open source is evolving. Uh, there's GitHub sponsors is just uh, now, and that will that will change a lot as uh, more open source developers um, choose what they want to work on. Say, well, yeah, I could work for a big corporation, make money, or I can build something that I believe in. A bit more like scientists. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna. I, I I have one more interesting question, so I'm gonna just go ahead yeah. and ask this one as well. Um, would data, would, uh, from Imke, we have a question, would data personal stores, uh, well, personal data stores, right, mm -hmm. uh, work for large sizes of data, like terabytes of data? Uh, if every user has their own copy of a terabyte of data, then uh, the, somebody will have to pay for that story. Right. Um, but uh, you could deduplicate the data, so um, uh, even if it's encrypted, um, you could have um, store it only once, and then uh, have just a, a, an access key to it in your personal data store. Yeah. So that's probably what you do if you have oh, a terabyte. Yeah, I see. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm looking uh, forward. So we're going to start our panel, uh, Data Sovereignty, Dare to Share. hope by the end of it, we will dare to share a little bit more. <laughs> Um, here we have, in addition to Michiel, who I've already introduced, we have uh, Professor Andre Decker from the Personal Health Train. Uh, Professor Decker is a medical physicist and professor of clinical data science at the Maastricht University Medical Center and the Maastricht Clinic. Uh, his clinical data science group, uh, consisting of 40 people, works on federated fair data infrastructures, AI for health uh, outcome prediction models, applying AI or artificial intelligence to improve the lives of patients and citizens. He has 180 publications, has moderated, uh, has uh, mentored 30 PhD students and many patents and awards on uh, p federated data and artificial intelligence. Um, we have also Frank Dijkstra from SURF. Uh, he works on the data exchange project from the SURF Open, uh, well, it used to be the Open Innovation Lab, now it's the innovation uh, section of SURF. Um, he is uh, committed, uh, he has a background in computer networks, is committed to get more confidential data to researchers. 
while making sure data owner returns control. Uh, he's worked on a prototype of a data exchange and is now exploring his applicability with the University of Amsterdam, KB, the Odyssey project, and many others. And uh, connecting remotely, we have uh, Annette Scherpenzel, Dr. Annette Scherpenzel. She's head of the micro data services at the uh, CBS, or uh, Statistics Netherlands, as they say in, in English. She's a psycho uh, psychologist and method methodologist. She has experience in uh, fundamental research and applied survey research. She's previously been a survey manager. Uh, and, and, and involved with organization and data collection of large scientific studies. And currently at the Microdata Services, she enables researchers to use enormous amount of, register, uh, of registered microdata at the, at the CBS uh, in a secure and um, convenient way. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to jump in with, um, so, so maybe one of the fundamental questions we have here is, um, on one hand, if we want to share data, that's the issue of privacy. And on the other hand, we want to make this accessible to researchers, so we are dealing with reuse. Um, what is the balance here? How, where, where do these interact? Where, where does, what do we have to consider um, in, um, in uh, dealing with these two issues at the same time? So especially for different kinds of data, so it might be privacy sensitive data, maybe copyrighted data. What do we have uh, to consider here? Uh, Andre, can you maybe start off with that? Yes, well, thank you, for, first of all, for having me here. And thank you, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, on this question or on this topic, um, in, in healthcare, obviously, this balance is very tricky because um, we all know that healthcare is based on all the experience of all the patients that we've treated in the past. And so we need access to that data to improve healthcare. That's, that is clear. Um, however, for an individual patient, the giving this access is not um, really beneficial, right? So this is really a, a solidarity aspect almost. Um, what I do see, and I might, I might be opinionated, is that the balance has really been off the last years, right? It's way too focused on privacy and not enough on the value of data. Mm -hmm. And patients uh, forum, um, when we talk to them, they actually um, are much more um, willing to, to share their data for the common good than uh, you would expect based on the, on the normal population, on citizens. And so apparently it's the case in healthcare, if you're a patient and you understand the value of data, and you, you want to share your data uh, quite readily, whereas the normal population is less um, attuned to that. So um, I think we have to establish more the value of reuse of data and why that is important. And of course, we have to protect privacy, but I do feel, and, and we had just had a presentation on this, that there are many technologies that can do this very, very nicely and, yeah. and with sufficient um, security and guarantees of privacy. So I do think the value of data is sometimes underestimated. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you think that how well the patients are informed also plays a role here? Yes, it does. Um, Kind of like the terms of service that was not read, right? So. Right. So to, I, th I think one of the issues that, that, and that's why we're developing this concept of the personal health train. Huh? So the personal health train, just for people that don't know it, has a metaphor in it. You have stations of data, um, and you have researchers that want to ask a question, which are trains. And rather than sending the data to the researchers, we send the, the, the question to the data, right? So the uh, algorithm to the data. Yeah. So you get a train to a station. Now, the benefit of that system, many people think, well, the benefit is you are not sharing data, so privacy is preserved, right? Yeah. The data doesn't leave your hospital in our case. But to be honest, I think the much more valuable part of this is that you can decide to share your data or to have your data used when the train comes in. So you actually have to make a decision about do I want to answer this question? Yeah. And that's a much more valuable thing, right? Because w when we click away the cookies, right, we, uh, we basically give it away for everyone to do anything with it. Yeah. In a personal health train, every time a train comes in, you can make that decision there and then, right? So you may say, well, you know, this is a researcher from the Dutch Cancer Society uh, that works in, you know, in the VMC. Yes, I want to answer this question. Oh, no, this is, you know, a health insurance company or a life insurance company trying to build an algorithm to find uh, yeah, you know, people that lied. Yeah. You might say no. By 
switching, so by, by using this concept, you can decide any time people want to use your data. And of course, you can set profiles, like, you know, I don't want to ask, uh, answer commercial questions right. with my data. Yeah, and then I think make a bigger filter, kind of. Yeah, yeah and the more, I think it's, it's, it is more granular and, and really deciding at the moment your data is used. And pods, to be honest, kind of work the same way, right? You can get that access anytime Facebook wants to look at your pod, you can say yes or no. Okay, so that c comes back to Michiel's work in that yeah. sense. Uh, 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 well, the, the whole bringing um, data to the, da the algorithm to the data reminds me a bit of the data exchange uh, project that Frake is working on. Frake, what do you think? Well, I think in this case, uh, to me, bring the algorithm data really brings in that privacy aspect. So I'm not entirely sure if I totally agree with you on that. Uh, the question also to me is, is, do individual patients want to have that level of control there? And, and uh, I can imagine, and I think it's good that they have that, but I wonder if that skills. It's, you're right. I mean, the, the system is privacy preserving by its nature, right? Yeah. So that is a big benefit. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, however, um, we do feel the second aspect, you know, having to deciding yourself whether or not your question, um, um, it, you're allowed a question to be answered is a benefit and we think it can be scaled by using profiles, right? So you might have a profile of a patient which is governed, for instance, by the, uh, you know, your, your patient society that says, well, you know, this is the profile of trains that you should allow because it comes from trusted researchers or it comes from um, um, certain questions we re really think are important to answer from our uh, disease community. Um, and so that's the way we think this will scale, right? To have almost, almost creative commons type things where you accept to do in your data or not. Yeah. We, does, we do think it does feel. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a great answer. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of shift a little bit the subject here to, um, so when, when, we're talking about, when we're talking about sharing, there's, there's something we, we're, we're constantly talking about, okay, it's, is it okay to do this? Are we allowed to? Sometimes it's a matter of consent, but it seems like we have some kind of underlying not only le legal but ethical idea in mind of what is okay and not okay to do and not, not always as, as all things ethical not everybody agrees with that yeah. uh, I'm going to address the next question to Annette because they're dealing with a different kind of data Annette is dealing with uh, registry data so data that's I mean is, there's no con so for instance from um, from public registers also I think from um, yeah for pub data that's anyway uh, registered via most of the time, I think, by the government, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, th there's also this question there is that there's not an agreement. So are, are we allowed to use this re re research for data? And um, if we're allowed to use this research for data, who is allowed to do it? What are the underlying governing principles there? Annette, can you enlighten us a little bit? Yes, yes. It's correct that we, uh, well, a statistic now is like in any statistical office, we have registered data about the whole population. And people do not give us this, their data by choice. It's just our uh, legal uh, task that we got, get from the government to collect these data to produce uh, statistics for policies. Um, however, we also open up that data for researchers so they can use it in a secure and safe environment, a remote access environment, under certain conditions. So we do not give access to all parties that want to use it as a kind of strict procedure. And in doing that, we, we keep in mind very strictly also that balance that we were just talking about uh, in, the, in the previous question, the balance between we really want to give a value to the data we have. We have so many data in the registers that it's way more than we can ever use ourselves for producing statistics. So in the common interest, it's also good to give access to other researchers to that data. At the same time, we constantly weight that, that value of data and research against the, our duty to protect the privacy of, uh, of all the, the, the individuals and also uh, organizations that we have data about. Because the, the essential part for any statistical office is also to preserve the trust that, that individuals and organizations have in the way we as a government organization handle our data and preserve their privacy. Uh, if we don't do that in the right way, no one can do, do research anymore because we will lose the trust of people how we handle their data. Yeah. So for us, that balance is, is a constant thing that we wait constantly. Any 
uh, any uh, application to use the data, we look at that again. Is it really a, a research question of common interest? Is it beneficial for society, for policy? What is the party that wants to use it? And what is the risk in, of identification or privacy involved? So for every application, we look at that again. And that's, that's really essential, I think, for the way we handle it. Um, it's a little bit different than what was said earlier about data from patients, because an individual patients can see the individual benefit that he or she might have long term or short term from using the data. I mean, for, for the citizens of the whole population, that is maybe not so clear what the, the general benefit or individual benefit is in use of their data. So they, they have trust that we keep it and that we preserve it. And they do not immediately see the interest or the benefit of, of giving access to that data. Yeah. So nevertheless, what I say, we do it, but it's the kind of question that we ask ourselves constantly. What is the balance and what is, uh, yeah, what is the ethical side of that? I, 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 I mean, we run the risk of losing trust in society if we give too many people access. On the other side, we have a sort of moral obligation to enable research in the common interest with all the data that we have anyway. It should not be lying there on a the shelf and not be used. That's right. another ethical right. side of the question. I, th I find that the four or five questions that you mentioned uh, uh, interesting, uh, underlying, I, I mean, they're not easy to answer, they're not straightforward, but they they're give you direction and what the frame reference should be, I think, to some extent. And uh, I, mm -hmm. I don't know, if any, does anybody else find, have something to uh... well I think I would like to ask you that if, if you if you agree with me that that this ethical question also the privacy question to be honest uh, can only be answered once the the question is known C certainly the ethical aspect right do we want to answer this question as society is something you only know when a question is known and then second also the privacy depends on you know are you in our case for instance right do you want to know something about rare patients that's a higher privacy risk than, than common patients but will you say do we want to answer this question so yeah. it could be if we don't answer it's kind of like n saying no right yes yeah. but, but my point is so you i think you can only answer those questions once the, uh, the, the ethical dimension or the privacy mm -hmm. dimension yeah. once the question is known yeah okay right? do you agree on that on that you, you mean the research question or? yes yeah yeah i know exactly that's exactly what i mean so any any researcher or user that wants to get access to the microdata statistics now has to make an application describing the purpose and the aim of the research the research question and the kind of data that they need to answer it and we make a judgment on the basis of that if, if it is a, if it is a question of, of general uh, interest um, and um, and if the data that, that that is to be used can answer that question yeah and what the risk is of course yeah. I, I think this also kind of uh, touches upon the question that we have from Axel here so Axel is asking um, from Andre are patients willing to share their personal data for any purpose of the common good, or will they give only consent to user data for a very specific and well-defined purpose? I, I assume that he's asking this because he wants to know, because you said that patients are yeah, less so reluctant than you think to right. share. On general, they are willing to share the data for any purpose. Of common good, there's a, there's a dislike of commercial use and yeah. commercial research, commercial partners, right? But there are also patients that are very specific, right? I don't want you to share my data with that researcher because I don't like him or her. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that happens. Okay. Or that you know, I don't like that type of research. I don't yeah. like that. Uni I don't like that doctor. Interesting. Okay. It happens. Okay. Yeah. But in that case, the patient, individual patients, get to make the decision who to share it with. Sure. In this case of the CBS Statistics Netherlands, you can't. CBS actually makes a decision. Yes. Yeah, so that's true. We make a choice for them. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. not possible that that because people don't even know they are in the register sometimes. Yeah. So we make that choice for them actually. Yeah, and that is why it's so important for us to do that in a good way to preserve what I mentioned before, the trust people have and how we handle their data and what we do with it. Yeah, you have a very crucial role there. A big responsibility. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, Andre, you have another question. So focus on data from Irene. Uh, focus on data and who asked the question, but what about how the question is asked? The quality, uh, the quality of the PEG algorithm or train? Right, so this is a... I, th I think besides the ethical dimension, right, mm -hmm. should we answer the question? I think her, um, her, her comment is about what's the scientific quality of the question, yeah. right? Uh, garbage in, garbage out kind of routines. Yeah. Um, and I know CBS has an opinion on that, but we don't. 
<laughs> okay. Because it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've had so many times my own questions being rejected because statistician doesn't believe in AI or machine learning. So oh, okay. to judge the scientific quality of a question is up to the, the, the research. These are very interesting to me. Right. <laughs> I didn't know it's, I, we, we only look at this from an ethical dimension, from a privacy dimension, but right. not about the... But, I mean, this, this brings it back to be a kind of matter of personal taste of whoever is making that decision, almost. Yeah. I'm sure Annette will want to jump well, in. Well, you, you assume that if a researcher from a trusted university asks you the question that has gone yeah. to review there, yeah. right? And you, but if every individual hospital or every individual patient, pod owner, what, yeah. has to make that judgment, yeah. that's not going to work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, Annette, do you have very briefly uh, yeah, a couple of uh, selfies? We, we do not judge the, the, the quality of the research question in a sense that we do not look at whether it's a valid research question or what is the design of the study. That's not our responsibility. Uh, that's, that's the responsibility of the researcher. We do look at the research question in a different sense. It's more a legal sense. We, we look if it fits within, within the task that the, the, the CBS has from a legal perspective, and that is to provide statistics and scientific results. So if we judge only on, on, on whether it is a scientific result that is in the common interest or not. So we do not look at the quality of the research question or the, the study design as such. No. No. Okay, good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question from the audience from Andre and we'll move on to the maybe next question uh, because this is all, uh, a kind of uh, self-interest for surf. Uh, to add to the question of Axel Michiel Schok is asking, uh, would it matter to the patient if they know that the research will be performed local instead of on the big tech cloud? No. For instance, on surf? No. <laughs> okay. No. I mean, patients assume that you are handling their data securely. They don't really care about why. Okay. They really care about the, the way that it's... They assume you, are, you, you do this properly. But for you, it matters? Of course. Yeah. That's a, yeah. But for an individual patient, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, question for Freik. We can just move on to Freik. How can a researcher research team collaborate with the Surf Data Exchange project well, from first Nargis. Of, yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, I have to explain that the data exchange we build at Surf is still a prototype. So actually, we like to collaborate and, and just uh, uh, ask us to collaborate because we like that, because we like to understand better what type of service in the end we should offer to share more data, because that's what we yeah. want in the end, yeah. but still preserving that privacy. And what does work? Is it indeed bring that algorithm to the data, or does it have to do with, uh, for example, better anonymization, for example, bringing synthetic data, or yeah. is there some other answer to it? And what type of, who should be in control, what we answered before? Okay, yeah. Okay, I'm going to, we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to open up another question, maybe can you say a couple of minutes on this, because I think it's also interesting. So, um, there's on one hand, there are users or any data producers, different kinds of entities that produce data, and we have um, uh, patients or any other data entity that produce data, and we have users of data, for instance, researchers, as most of the cases we're talking about. So uh, most of the time we can't just like buy the data, but there's a demand and uh, rec there's like a pro producing and demand kind of a marketplace situation here. So Michiel, how do you think, um, how do you think we can deal with this? How can we incentivize? How can we uh, allocate this, this kind of demand and <laughs> request? Um, well, I think uh, most people will, um, will agree to have their data shared if they believe it's in the common interest. And uh, I think a lot of people trust uh, institutions like CBS to make this decision for them. Uh, I know I would, I know they're data experts. And just like I trust these institutions to keep their computer systems safe, uh, if they um, allow some algorithm to be run in their systems, then I trust them. And if they say, well, it's allowed to be copied to this other system because it's just as safe, Okay, the, 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 um, statistically you could think that the data leak risk is multiplied, is, is doubled if you use two systems. Um, but then my, the question to me as a, as a user or as a data subject would be, what is the actual risk for me? And I think there are, f um, there are maybe three or four reasons why I would not want my data to be shared. It's, so one is if you, um, uh, data about me is becomes identifiable and it affects my personal life. Maybe yeah. I cannot longer have access. Okay. Um, maybe it's uh, it's it it becomes uh, public and gets attri attributed to me negatively. So uh, maybe yeah, maybe some embarrassing uh, video yeah. becomes public. Um, okay. So um, 
and and only one of them would be that if it's uh, if it's secret uh, like a, a business secret yeah. or a creation of me where I'd actually want to get paid for it okay so. I think we have to wrap up because we're running completely out of time I oh. think maybe we should make a separate uh, half-day workshop about sharing data let's <laughs> talk about this there's for a lot to go days. on still <laughs> yes <laughs> we'll try to arrange something from surf next time mm. uh, thank you all for joining I really enjoyed the discussion and and just hearing your different perspectives and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon thank you <laughs>